All right, good afternoon. Welcome to EfficientML.ai uh, lecture 16. Today we are going to introduce diffusion models and how to accelerate diffusion models uh, with advanced techniques. Uh, so in the last lecture, I uh, introduced the deep generative learning. So we first sample from a data distribution to obtain a network. And later, we try, after cleaning uh, this network, we can use the network to predict uh, new images, new contents. So that's generative learning. Uh, comparing this kind of discriminative model versus generative model, a discriminative model gave a input and trying to classify it, trying to predict the bounding box, trying to predict the pixels, the sentiment. So we are given a, a text or an input trying to pre predict its attributes. So trying to make a decision boundary. On the other side, the generative model is giving a label, giving a class, giving a condition, the text. We try to generate uh, the content, the image, the text. So uh, trying to model to learn the probability distribution of the data. So there are lots of popular applications uh, using the techniques that we are going to learn in this lecture. Uh, such as Adobe Firefly, the Mid Journey, Dali 3 for those content generation. So a lot of comp uh, applications by using the diffusion models. So there is a pretty wide range of deep generative learning approaches. Uh, so today we are going to focus on the uh, diffusion models. And this is the agenda for today's lecture. We'll start with the basics of diffusion models. Uh, introducing the denoising diffusion models, and also how to add condition uh, to the diffusion model, latent diffusion models, uh, how, to, how to use it to edit the image, and also personalize the model. And then we are going to talk about acceleration techniques, and how to uh, reduce the number of steps by using fast sampling techniques like DDIM, and also by using progressive distillation uh, to get fewer number of steps and also using guided distillation um, to reduce the number of forward, uh, forward um, uh, feed forward iterations. And also uh, those acceleration techniques by using sparsity and by using quantization to accelerate diffusion models. We're going to see some domain specific techniques, although we call it sparsity and quantization, they're actually quite different, some unique techniques in this domain specific setting. So let's start with the denoising diffusion models basics. There are two concepts. So um, the denoising diffusion probabilistic models for DDPM basically have, consists of two processes. So the first process is the forward diffusion process when we are gradually adding noise to the input. The input gets more and more noisy. And there's also the reverse path. This reverse diffusion process is generating the image from the noise. It starts with the noise and then gradually denoise um, to generate the data by denoising. Compared with GAN models, which we learned from the last lecture, uh, this kind of forward process defines an iterative pro mapping process, not just one time, but iterative mapping from data distribution to a Gaussian noise. And this backward pass learns to reverse the forward process uh, step by step. So learn very fine um, uh, grain of those details step by step. Rather than again, you just do it once. So this is some uh, illustration about the forward process and also the reverse process. In the forward process, uh, we can see we destroyed the data original image, we destroy the data by gradually adding um, small amount of noise. So starting with clean image, and in the, in the end, it becomes Gaussian noise. Compared with that, we have a, a reverse process starting with noise and gradually denoise to create data by gradually denoising um, a noisy code from a stationary distribution. So starting with uh, pure noise and then uh, we denoise to get the original uh, to get the target desired image. So in this forward process, we can model the relationship between xt and xt minus one 
as a Gaussian distribution. So the mean, uh, this is the mean, and this is the variance. So beta is a predefined uh, constant to control the diffusion speed, which is only related to t. Okay? And it's linearly, linearly growing with the time step, gradually adding more and more noise uh, to, the, uh, to the input image. So this is the relationship between adjacent two steps, x t minus one, and also x t, okay, with the condition of x t minus one to get x t. But how do we sample x t directly from x zero, okay, from x zero to x t? So we can do a little bit of math. Don't be afraid of it. I'll walk you through. So here we plug in the equation. This is the mean. This is a variance. Okay, this is following a uh, Gaussian distribution here, the relationship between xt minus one and xt is like this. These are constants. Beta is only related to t. We can do a little um, a transformation, define r, r by t equal to one minus beta t. So we can transform the relationship into the second row. And then we can plug in xt minus one using a similar form. Okay. The relationship between xt minus 1 and xt minus 2 can use similar form of the equation so that we can get the relationship between xt minus 2 and also xt. And here is uh, epsilon t minus 2 is also following a Gaussian distribution. So now we have two Gaussian distributions, epsilon t minus 1 and also epsilon t minus 2. So adding two Gaussian distributions basically um, the variance, we are adding the variance together uh, and square it. And so that we can merge these two terms together into a single term, and we put a bar here to distinguish them. Okay, so we have a single uh, Gaussian term here, and the beginning term stays the same. We can repeat this process on and so on until we reach x0. Okay, so it's an iterative process from x t to x t minus 1 to x t minus 2, and all the way to x0, okay? and you have a chain of alpha t, alpha t minus one, all the way to alpha one, together with a Gaussian distribution here. We define a new term uh, for this combination. Uh, this alpha multiplied them together, we denote it as alpha t bar. Then we can plug it, simplify the writing. Uh, the relationship between x t and x zero is like this. So now we can get the relationship from x0 directly to xt. Okay, it's a normal distribution. This is the mean, this is the variance. So we can uh, directly uh, get from zero to a certain time stamp. And just rely on these two definitions, alpha t and alpha t bar, so that we can get, uh, this is repeating the equation from the previous slide, the relationship between xt0 and also xt, as this is the mean, and this is the variance. We call it a diffusion kernel. And this is what alpha t bar looks like. As t goes on, it's gradually a diminishing to zero. So for the sampling process, x, we know x zero, so we can get xt. This is the relationship. And here we are having a um, normal distribution in the back. And beta t is designed such that alpha t is close to zero when, um, and also the relationship between um, um, q, uh, x zero and x t is following a normal distribution. So x t, uh, alpha t, when it's getting, t is getting large, it's close to zero. So let's now see the reverse process, the reverse denoising process from x t all the way to x t zero. Uh, I have to assume when beta t is small, the relationship between x t and x t minus one is also a Gaussian, so that we can write it uh, in this format. This is the mean, this is the variance. The mu theta uh, x t is the mean, which we are going to predict, and it's learnable. Actually, that's where the essence of uh, this class. So, and here uh, we define the uh, sigma t to, uh, sigma t squared to be equal to beta t. It's a little bit of math, but we'll go, uh, go to them relatively quickly since we are focusing on the engineering 
aspect. So um, this is the loss. We're trying to define the loss so that we learn how to, how to train it. So uh, this is the minus log P x0. x0 is the real data. We want to maximize its log, log likelihood. And by using this evidence lower bound, and find the bound which we are going to not going to put them in this lecture. Uh, by using this is basically the joint distribution from x0 all the way to xt. And this is a loss function we are trying to minimize. Omitting some linear algebra, we can simplify that into three terms. Uh, since here, uh, this equation is parameterized by theta, the first term is not related to theta. So we only focus on the uh, second and third term. Uh, for the relationship between xt0 and also xt minus 1, we can use conditional probability uh, to simplify it in this way. Okay? So this is the Gaussian. The other term uh, we have seen before from t to t minus 1 is also a Gaussian. Okay? So both of them are Gaussian so that we can further simplify that. And this first, uh, this first term um, is, can simplify them in a similar manner. So let's first try to simplify the middle term. And soon we are going to see how to map this into PyTorch language if you're not comfortable with the math. Don't worry about it at all. Omit some linear alge uh, some algebra. Uh, the loss function is basically uh, this, square, uh, this square term. And trying to minim minimize this square term, we want to make this mu theta xt equal to uh, this big term so that we have the square uh, that is minimized. Notice this epsilon is a noise. Uh, the added noise is only the only unknown. So that's the goal our neural network is going to predict. Okay, so uh, epsilon theta, theta is the parameter of the unit. Uh, is trying to predict the added noise. So all what we're doing by deep learning is trying to predict the noise and okay? predict the noise given the input. Given a noisy image, we try to predict the noise. Okay? And we subtract the image uh, subtract the noise from this image, okay, and then we're trying to get this mu theta so that we can plug in this mu theta back into this equation and assuming this relationship from x0 to xt um, during the forward, proce uh, uh, forward process, we can plug it in to simplify it in this way. Okay? Lt uh, minus, minus 1 can be simplified in this way. So this L0, which is right here, uh, also have a very similar form. So now we get a relationship. Okay? Given the image, uh, we try to predict the noise using epsilon theta. Epsilon theta is the unit where bulk, the bulk of the computation is spent on. Okay? And we uh, try to predict the, the noise and use that as the loss term. So writing that again, uh, we uniformly sample from 1 to t and also sample a, um, a correct image, target image, and also sample a Gaussian noise. And this is the ground truth noise we are trying to uh, predict. And this is the function, the unit. Um, we are trying to uh, apply a neural network. Uh, given the input, we are trying to predict the noise. And this is basically the xt, the input by calculated by the diffusion kernel using x0. So we simply set uh, lambda t equal to 1 for better um, perceptual quality. And so far, lots of math, but everything can be condensed into a very intuitive image. And this is what I want you to remember, not the math equations, but this intuitive picture. Let's walk them through carefully. So given x0, and multiply with a constant term. This is what alpha t looks like with t is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and this is a random noise, random Gaussian noise, multiplied with one minus this term. Okay? And then you add them together, you have a noisy image. You can still tell it's a cat, but it's um, uh, added a lot of noise. And you pass this through a unit, okay? down sample and then up sample pass through this unit, trying to predict the noise. Okay, So all we are doing here, everything unique in this lecture, is that we are doing a pixel-to-pixel, pixel-wise -pixel prediction, 
given a noisy input, original input, noise, noisy input, given a noisy input, trying to predict the noise. How to predict it? By matching that with the noise you added to the input image. Is that how we closed the loop? Okay. Given a noisy input, trying to predict the noise that was added to the image. Okay, so we can uh, make it a lot more easier to understand by see uh, the tweeting algorithm. Uh, so we uniformly sample a T from time one to time T, and then we sample an input image, such as a cat, it can also be a dog, as long as from your uh, desired uh, distribution. And then we sample a, a Gaussian noise, okay? and we um, get the XT uh, following this equation. This is the original input image, okay? original clean image. And this is the, the noise. This is the noise. Okay? And add them together, we have XT. Okay? Add them together, we have XT. And then we feed this XT to epsilon theta. What is epsilon theta? It's a unit. Theta is the parameter. The uh, tens of millions of parameters. Uh, this is epsilon theta. Okay, we feed it to the epsilon theta. And it's also prime parameterized by t, since during different timestamps it can be different. So we pass uh, this xt through this u net and trying to predict a noise. Okay, we are trying to predict a noise. And we are trying to minimize the difference between the predicted noise versus the original noise. And that's all we are doing as a loss function. Uh, that's all what the equation previously is about. You want to predict the noise. But would it be the same if you try to predict the image? And the network predict the image? Yes. Uh, I don't know if that works. There is something special about the fact that it's correct. Right. And these terms, you have to be very careful. That's all what the derivation is about. Yeah, so this is a training algorithm. And let's see, what about a sampling time? What do we do over there? So let's again start with the intuitive image. Okay, so we uh, have a noisy, uh, noisy uh, image. We try to get a clean image. And what do we do here? Again, pass it through a unit okay, and trying to predict the noise. And we subtract the noise. Of course, there are certain terms right here. Uh, those are just constants. Uh, with, with respect to the t, okay? so this is um, alpha t uh, going down linearly. This is alpha t bar multiplying them together, goes to zero in the end. And this is uh, uh, sigma t square going to uh, increasing. So this is the these constant terms. So the essence is that we are trying to subtract this noise from this noisy input. Okay? The unit is predicting the noise. We are subtracting the noise from the original noisy input and trying to get a uh, denoised image. But here, interesting part here, we also added another Gaussian noise. And then this is a, becomes the next time step, t x t minus y. Okay, so this is x t um, noisy image, x t minus y, still a noisy image, but less noisy. I just repeat this process until it gets a completely clean image. Okay, so this is a intuitive, image, I hope you can remember. And on the right-hand side, you can naturally translate um, this into the algorithm. Okay, so starting with xt, which is completely a uh, random noise. And then from t to one, we are doing the reverse process. So this is from t to one. Uh, we sample a Gaussian noise, this here. Um, and then we use xt x input, feed it to the u net, which is epsilon theta. Theta is the parameter in our um, in our unit, use the unit to predict the noise and use xc to subtract the noise. Okay, and that gets this term. And finally, we added uh, the Gaussian noise to get the next xt minus one. And from xt minus one, we uh, continue in the for loop to predict xt minus two and until x zero. So that's the 
denoised image we are going to return. So that's the same thing where this equation is about. Um, so if you can remember the equation and also about the equation and also the intuitive uh, illustration of this process. So where is the bulk of the computation? It's here, it's the unit. Although area-wise it's a small, but actually most of the computation is going here. It's a pixel-wise prediction. Given a noisy input, predict the noise. You have large resolution here, then you have large resolution here. Okay, so that's where the bulk of the computing is going. And these are all like pixel-wise subtraction. Okay, pixel-wise addition doesn't have a lot of computing. All right, so um, using diffusion model, these are some of the examples uh, emerging as powerful generative models or performing GAN sometimes, uh, some cool images. All right, so what if we want to generate specific stuff like particular class or given a text to generate the image? Oh, so there's a metric called uh, FID. People use that. So previously, we generated a lot of uh, uh, generated image versus real world image and measure the similarity with the uh, pixel wise uh, difference with the real world image. And check out FID for that. All right. So it's about how do we add condition, right? If you use mid journey, you want to type into some some words to generate a moon, generate something, a horse riding a moon, right? So um, how do we add those conditions? We call it condition, okay? So unconditional generation is basically uh, using this term. And if we uh, compare with the conditional generation of xt minus one, not only depend on the previous xt, but also depend on the c, c is the condition. Um, so here uh, we have mu theta not only as a function of x t but also as a function as uh, this condition, and that's the only difference. So here uh, the unit previously has only one input, which is x t. Now it has a uh, another t, but now it has another input as condition, which is um, the text or the image or the class label uh, you input as a condition. Okay, so this epsilon now has three parameters, the image, the timestamp, and also the condition. So let's see um, what, what kind of condition types are there. Okay, we can have a scalar condition, like a class, generate me some dogs, generate me some cats, um, a class ID, uh, just a single scalar class ID. We can also have pixel-wise condition. Any pixel-wise condition like, um, so this should be actually, um, this should be text condition. There's a typo here. This should be text condition. And a sequence of text tokens, like a photo of a moon gate. G, make sure you edit, uh, polish the slide to fix. This should be text condition on the, on the slide. Okay, this is very widely used uh, mid journey these days. Like you give a text, uh, description what you are trying to generate. The next one is the pixelized condition, like giving a mask, like a, cat, a mask of a cat or um, a canny edge of a building. So pixelized condition. So let's start with the scalar uh, condition, like a, like a class ID. Okay, so this is the original feature map, and we want to add those class condition to the feature map. So we pass it through an encoder so that we can get a representation by batch size versus uh, C, C is the number of um, channels. Okay, we pass it through the MLP to match the number of channels to be the same as the feature map. So here we have four channels. Uh, the embedding here should also have four channels. So the C here matches with the C here. And then we can do a broadcast add broadcast this pixel to the entire XY location, uh, similar for this pixel to the second channel, 
for the entire xy location so that we can get a conditional feature map. This is the simplest uh, method to add a scalar condition. A more improved version is basically uh, double that. Okay? We have not only um, addition, but also multiplication. So we uh, predict a scale and also a bias okay? to scale the feature map and then add the bias. That's why here we have multiplication and addition. So that's how we insert the scalar class condition. Okay. The next is the tags condition. How is mid-journey handling the tags we input to the image? So that's using a cool technique called the cross attention. Okay, so we have the input feature. We talk about VIT. We chop the image into several patches, and each patch becomes a token. So that's the uh, that's the queue, that's the query. And K and V are basically the text conditions, like photo of a moon gate. This is the text we feed to Mid Journey. We treat them as K and V. Okay? We use um, um, pass it through a W matrix to transform it uh, to get a feature as K, and pass it through the WV um, to uh, project it as the as the value, and then we pass it through attention. Why well, we call it cross attention because some of them is coming from image, some of them like K and V is coming from the text. Well, Q is coming from the image. And then we pick each patch, each token from the image and to multiply with a K to get the similarity, to get the attention. And we use softmax to make it uh, sum up to one. And then we use that as the weight uh, to get a weighted average of, of the V of the value, okay? And this comes becomes a output token. So we can repeat this process through all the uh, input uh, image tokens and to get a uh, output image. So this is how cross attention works by using um, a QK transpose, softmax, sum up to one, regular, uh, scale it by, uh, by dimension and then times V. Uh, to get the um, text information injected into the image. Okay, so there's a text information injected into uh, the image. So finally, the output token is an image token. You put it back and becomes uh, the um, mingled text and image. This is a very effective way to mingle the text with image by using cross attention. Okay, so the last uh, last type, uh, how to inject condition, is by using this pixel-wise uh, condition. So a very intuitive way, for example, we wanna generate a cat that looks like, in this position, it looks like this. So we can just put the segmentation map uh, concatenated with the noise, okay, and then predict, trying to predict the noise. Very simple, just concatenate, other, uh, so other better methods. One of the represented one is the control net, which got published in ICCV uh, one month ago, a very fresh, very widely used technique. Uh, it's actually pretty cool, given the input uh, canny edge. This is default generated here. You can also input the text, um, the text condition like masterpiece of fairy tale, giant deer, golden antlers. Queen City, Gaelic, something. So all the generated image looks like the uh, canny edge input, canny edge condition. Okay? Or we can input a human pose, human pose, again, it's a pixel-wise condition. I make sure the generated uh, man all follow uh, this gesture, follow this pose. Okay? You can generate default, hand is here exactly following uh, the condition, or chef in kitchen, or Lincoln statue. You can have not only the text, but also such uh, pose condition and also canny edge uh, condition. And they all look very similar in their pose. And how is that achieved? Okay, so um, it's very interesting by using control net. Just before you have a neural network block, 
Um, what we added here, we fixed this original neural network block, but make a copy, okay? Make a trainable copy, initialize the same way as the original neural net block. And we add a zero convolution before and after. It's a bit misleading by talking about zero convolution. In fact, there are zero initialized one by one convolution. So initially they are zero, but after training, they may not be zero. Why initially they are zero? Because as if you don't have this branch, adding this zero branch, injecting the condition, initially they are not injecting anything because they are initialized with a zero. So it's just using this main branch in the beginning. But after training, uh, this convolution, this convolution, they are both one by one, they are no longer zero. So that it can inject the condition from the top. That's a key idea from control net. And we can stack multiple such blocks together. So this is the original U net, okay? down sample, up sample. So in the down sample phase, we are going to add uh, the control uh, the control branch. Okay? So uh, this is the could be the pixel wise conditions like the uh, pose map. It can also be the semantic mask. It can also be the canny edge. Uh, we show like the edge of the canny edge of the deer. Uh, as an input image, pixel-wise, okay? uh, we pass it through the ground zero convolution, and this is the uh, original uh, condition we inject by cross attention, like text prompt. We have seen the Lincoln statue text text prompt. This is still using uh, the cross attention to inject those text condition, and then we co copy the down sample stages from uh, the original. This is stable diffusions encoder block. I will copy them. And then uh, on the up sample stage, they don't have any, um, they are directly using zero convolution uh, to feed it back to the original uh, up sample phase of the stable diffusions decoder. So this is how this um, pixel wise uh, maps, either semantic math or canny edge or, or pose those conditions are injected. Okay, copy another branch, um, initialize with a zero, and this is copied, this is initialized with a zero, uh, feed it combined with cross attention with the original text prompt and feed it back um, to the original main branch. Okay? Throughout the training, the main branch is fixed. You don't touch the main branch, but only this side branch to inject the condition. Okay, so that's control net. And now we wanna talk about how do we treat diversity or quality. So we wanna also generate um, a specific um, class. Okay, so we talk about, we can not only given the class, we, we can get an image, but also we wanna make it follow this particular class. So we wanna train a classifier at the same time as the generator. Okay, so we add not only uh, the original gradient, but also the classifiers gradient, okay? And then the new sample distribution is defined as, this is just from this class to generate uh, this, uh, this XT, but also this XT should be predicted as this class. And we put a omega uh, as the strength to control uh, the relationship, the strength. So this original sampling plus the classifiers gradient to make sure the generated image will be classified as the original desired class. And we have a gui guidance strength omega on the top. So if you put them in the log space, this multiplication of these two terms becomes the, uh, the uh, addition. That's why we put omega uh, on the top because getting the log, they become a, a a, a multiplier in the front, okay? What it means to our uh, diffusion uh, equation is that basically we add another term, okay? another term to the, um, to the prediction, okay? So this is the original naive conditional sampling. Uh, we have a condition T and XT and trying to uh, subtract a uh, predict the noise. This is subtracting the noise. Um, I get the next step, okay? And uh, later, we not only predict the, the noise, subtract the noise, but also we added another term uh, trying to uh, minimize the loss, uh, trying to make the classifier, uh, we could classify uh, this XT as a desired class. Okay? 
So that's the new classifier gradient that gets introduced to make sure um, the generated image, they all belong to the same class. Okay? We wanna encourage the loss such that the generated image is all predicted as the desired class C in this case. And it actually it's pretty effective. Uh, like if Omega is pretty small, okay? Uh, there are some dogs, but not all of them look like dogs. Some of them doesn't look like dog. But if omega is pretty large, meaning that we want to make sure the loss of the classifier is pretty small so that all the generated image look like dog and actually looks like dog a lot. What are the limitations here? You train a classifier, it can only do classification. So it can only work on class condition. But how about text condition? How about pixelized condition? It's not straightforward. And also they need to train an additional network, a classifier, okay, which is complicated. So how do we solve this problem? So let's look at, rather than classifier guidance, let's look at classifier free guidance. Okay? So to support diverse condition, class, text, or pixels, okay? no extra, uh, don't need to train any actual classifier network. Okay, follows Bayes rule, given xt, I want to predict the c and re rewrite it in this way. Okay, this is a conditional model, this is an unconditional model, which hinted that now we want to forward the neural network twice. One is a conditional model, the other is an unconditional model, with c and without c, you want to double the flops. Later we are going to talk about how to reduce the compute over there. Um, so if you expand our previous equation defining the classifier guidance, remember there's an omega controlling the strength of the original loss versus the, uh, the new classifier introduced um, function. So we can further simplify that uh, by, by using Bayes rule uh, in this way. Okay, we can see there are two terms. Okay? Uh, in the log space, if we um, expand it, it'll be this one subtracted by the second term here. Uh, one is conditional, the other is unconditional. And one is conditional on C, the other is not conditioned on the C. And, the uh, and the, uh, here we have omega plus one, and here we have omega. And then if we continue uh, to derive um, the equation for the classifier free guidance, we can compare that with the original conditional training is actually quite simple. So during training time, we just sample the condition. Okay, previously we have this, uh, this condition. We always have this condition. Uh, given X, given T, given C, we try to predict the noise, minimize the distance. And now we try to, um, with probability unconditioned, okay, we randomly drop uh, the condition so that we can train it unconditionally. The C here has some probability to be, to be none, adding no condition. Okay, so uh, that's the only change. And C here is the same as the C here. Okay? Uh, so that's the only change. We sum, during sample, we uh, sample with some probability that the condition is not. What about at some point inference time? At inference time, remember we have used two terms. One is conditional, the other is unconditional. Okay? Uh, the constant here is omega plus one, here is omega. Okay? Remember the term here, omega plus one and omega. So that's the only change we made here. Uh, at inference time, we have to run the inference twice. Okay? Uh, combine the results of conditional and also uh, unconditional forward process. It's doubling the flops. We have to uh, do the same, um, run the same network twice. Okay? The network is on theta, epsilon theta. They are the same, we have to run it twice. And this is the result from no guidance versus uh, with gui guidance. Okay. Um, such large uh, W, you really need to better quality, but less diversity. So the advantage of such classifier free guidance is that it can generate to any conditional form, not just class. Uh, since we don't need to train a classifier, we don't need to train additional network. So this condition, if you see the previous equation, it can be uh, anything. You can use um, text condition, 
Remember, we talk about cross tension to inject uh, the text condition. Okay, and also we can use the pixel wise like a mask condition uh, by using the control net. Okay, so this is very simple. Just use with the condition. So without the condition, it can be any uh, method we have learned so far to inject the condition. Okay, not necessarily relying on it has to be a class. So this C can be any condition using the method we learn to inject the condition. And the only catch here is that we have to forward the network twice. All right, so that's a lot of content. Let's take a five minute break before we jump into latent diffusion models. All right, welcome back. Let's continue the discussion. So diffusion model seems pretty complicated math, but all we want to remember is that what we are predicting, we're predicting the noise. Okay? So classification network is predicting a class. Um, detection network is trying to predict the bounding box. Segmentation model is trying to predict the, seg uh, the mass. Diffusion model is trying to predict the noise. Why do we need to predict the noise? Because then we can denoise. Okay? That's the essence of the diffusion, diffusion model. Uh, so let's continue to talk about uh, the latent diffusion models. So when we have a high resolution, how do we generate a pretty high resolution image without incurring a lot of compute? So uh, we first pass through the image into a uh, pre-trained variational autoencoder to encode it into a latent space, which has much smaller resolution, like one quarter or one eighth of the resolution. Okay, and we use um, run the diffusion process in the uh, latent space. And then we uh, use the other half of the variational VIE, uh, the decoder part of it, uh, to try to reconstruct the image. Okay? So rather than um, running the diffusion on the original pixel, uh, uh, original pixel uh, space, we run it in the latent space. So the advantage that applying to the latent space is we can have simpler denoise because the resolution, the, the dimension is much smaller and also can lead to faster synthesis. That's actually very widely used. And algorithm-wise, it's actually just one line of code here, very simple. Uh, uh, we just uh, pass the original input image into an encoder and get a latent space. And we run the diffusion process in the latent space. Okay, So we add noise pass it through the UNet to predict the noise and try to minimize the loss. The only difference is here. We pass it through an encoder to make it have a lower resolution. Similarly, for the uh, sampling stage, rather than directly get the output, we pass it through a decoder to get the output. Everything before is exactly the same. Okay? So we have the, uh, the noise. Uh, we use new net to predict the noise, subtract the noise from the original input. We add the noise trying to get the next uh, next time step. And finally, for Z, uh, Z0, uh, we pass it through a decoder to reconstruct the original input. So this is widely used, like stable diffusion XL. They're using uh, such latent diffusion method, like astronaut in a jungle, code color palette, and also a deep sea uh, diver floating. So these are high resolution images compared with the cats and dogs we've seen before. Uh, the image resolution is much higher, much higher quality. They're all using such latent diffusion methods. Question. <laughs> Certainly, how do we edit it? That's exactly the next part we are going to talk about. How do we edit the image? Like we can draw something, draw a tower, draw some trees, draw a bedroom, draw some scenery. Okay, and how do we uh, use SD Edit to actually get the corresponding picture um, that, uh, that's associated with this hand uh, stroke based editing? So the idea is that we use our hand to draw something very naive, like roughly a tower, some cloud around it, and base on the bottom. Um, so that you assume the image distribution is here, our stroke is here, uh, there is some distance. And we add some noise to perturb it 
with some noise. Okay, so the stroke becomes becomes noisy, becomes noisy. And the good part is that you can assume this is a certain point in the diffusion process, and then we can predict the noise from here and gradually remove that predicted noise, gradually remove the predicted noise. And finally, uh, this center, this mean, will shift from here and gradually shift toward the original image, the real image distribution. So it looks like a real image output. And you first add a noise and then predict the noise, then subtract the noise. And that's the magic about how do we convert this stroke into the image. So this is stroke-based editing. Uh, we can also do image-to-image -image translation, uh, the original hand-drawn uh, picture, and then this is the generated picture. Again, we add a noise and then predict noise and then denoise so that we can shift the distribution from this hand-drawn image to the desired target style. What about text-based editing? Like here, the boulevard are crowded today. How can we tone down this crowded, make it less crowded? A lot of people here, fewer number of people. Um, a photo of a cat riding a bicycle, and change it to a photo of a cat riding a car, riding a car. And then here, um, this is just image, and then we want to add a style, a children drawing of a castle next to a river. We immediately turn the castle river into a children's style. Or we can add some jelly beans to the cake, add some jelly beans to the cake. And this looks like magic. How is that achieved? Remember, how did we inject the text prompt? By cross attention. Right? What is cross attention? Reminder, let's go through it again. So the pixel features, we um, uh, uh, chop it into uh, different patches. Each patch is a token that becomes the query. The the Q and the key and the V are both from the text. For example, here, uh, this is the, the a prompt um, sentence, so several prompt sentence. And you get an attention map, attention map for each query, you get attention map. So here, since we have five uh, text prompt tokens, and you get five uh, channels in the attention map. You multiply by the V, V is from the text. And then you get a target output. What about we do some manipulation for the words, like uh, removing bicycle and change it with a car? Everything is out there, everything else is the same. So here we want to just use the original um, uh, cross attention map from photo of a car riding a bicycle, so that the location of the bicycle is exactly remains the same. So here, up 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 to here. Everything is the same. We just plug in the new V, okay? the V, the last one of them is a car rather than a bicycle in this case. So that the cross attention map matters, uh, determines the location, the location doesn't change. Only the thing only changed is the V. So that original attention map, cross attention stays the same, only use the new V from, from bicycle to car. What about this case, adding jelly beans okay, to the decorations, adding some words. Okay, so here we add a new uh, phrase. So the old words will use the original cross attention map from old to new, and the new words use the new map. Okay, so new words, okay, longer uh, token, number of tokens in the key. So the attention map has more channels. Uh, the V also has more. So you have a uh, couple of new attention maps. What about um, weight, getting different weight, like uh, tuning down the crowded, make it less crowded or make it more crowded so we can simply reweighting, adjust the magnitude of a specific token. Like here you have five tokens, then you have five channels in the attention map. You want a particular token to tune up or tune down, you can weigh it, tune it up or tune it down for the certain corresponding channel um, in this way to tune it up or tune it down. So that's how to edit the image. How to personalize the image. Say, wanna draw a picture of this particular, this is my, or someone's lovely dog. We just wanna draw a particular dog in different places. 
Acropolis, in the dog house, in the bucket, sleeping, swimming, but everything is not a general dog, but it's my dog. It's a specific dog that should look like this. The Dream Booth is doing that, which is actually a challenging, uh, challenging task. For example, given the input image, which is a clock, very unique clock, the three is written in this, this way, a very artistic style. But Dali 2, using the image guidance, is not generating something exactly looking at my clock. The three is, in the, is not the style I want. Um, and also, we want to change the background. This is probably on the bed, but also I put it in the tech context of screen uh, outside. But this one is following the context, but the fidelity is poor. The three is in the middle. It's not actually here. Um, but by fine tuning, we can generate the same clock right in the background of several uh, green outdoors. And you can make it both maintain the fidelity and also uh, use new contacts. And how is that achieved? So Dream Booth basically fine tune the model. Okay? The model takes um, it's a text to input uh, to image model. Okay? So we have a couple of pair uh, uh, training data saying this is a dog, this is the dog, this is the dog. And we put it to fine tune this model so that it can generate a, a, a customized model. A generate a customized model, no longer the original general text to image, but this is a personalized text to image, just one model for one object. Okay, you have a dog, you get a new, train a new model. But later you wanna say, make an advertisement for, for another stuff, you have to train, fine tune another um, personalized text to image model. Okay, so the input is just a few images of a specific subject and the class name. And the process is basically fine tune the text to image model to create a personalized, personalized version of that particular subject. And output is a new model, okay, capable of generating images of that subject in different contexts. And the limitation is that you need one fine-tuned model. It's only specific to one subject. So here, like a tree personalized model, a V dog is in the beach. In the beach, a V dog is walking in a colorful carpet. It's a colorful carpet. Another limitation for like mid journey is that you cannot generate you know, faces like we what we want. Like Fei Fei is riding a horse, lady doesn't look like Fei Fei, right? But existing work either um, need actual fine tuning, right? Like the dream booth, you can find you need to fine tune the model, which is costly as we learn. Or it can generate poor multi person like Newton and Einstein. We want them to sit in the park. They get mingled together. It looks like each other. Um, or uh, you know, in our approach, you can, you can distinguish them rather than mingle together or overfit the reference image. So like Feifei riding a horse, you just have Feifei but no horse. Uh, but now we want to generate something like this, Feifei riding a horse. How is that achieved? Looks like a bit complicated, but let's walk you through that. Um, a woman and a man are standing together. So we first get a, a picture, taking a picture of the two, two subjects and find a, a segmentation mask. This can be easily obtained uh, using auto annotation tools, for example, using SAM. And then uh, you give the text prompt, pass it through the text encoder to get the text embeddings, a woman and a man sitting, standing together, okay? And you pass through the image into the image encoder, like the clip image encoder. And we concatenate, since we know, the man corresponds to this image, the woman corresponds to this image, we can concatenate the features from the text embedding with the subject embedding, okay? Um, and then we get a conditional embedding. So blue, oh, sorry, uh, red and green correspond to red and green here. And then we inject the conditional embedding uh, by cross attention we learned using the UNET, okay? So we fine tune the UNET, fine tune this projection, fine tune the encoder, such that it can learn that we should match the cross attention map for woman and man to be in this location rather than mingled together. Okay? So we are trying to minimize the distance between the woman's cross attention map with woman's segmentation mask, since we know woman should be here. 
and the man should be here. Okay, so by using such cross attention localization, we can solve this problem where people are in, entangled together. So at inference time, again, we have a text prompt, pass it through the text encoder, we get the tokens image. Through the image encoder, we also get the tokens. We add the corresponding uh, man, man, uh, into the uh, text with the image. And the trick here is we need a good delayed subject uh, in condition. So in the beginning, okay, this is in the beginning of the denoising step, we only take the original uh, pure text prompt to make sure it's, it's indeed someone and someone sitting in the park. And only later we want to refine it such that it's Newton and Einstein sitting in the park. And later we add, we take from this side on Newton and Einstein. So, so that we can generate the image can have a good trade-off. So this is about the cross attention map. Make sure without the localization and with the localization, we want to make sure uh, the man, the man correspond to the original image. And this is the trade-off when we should inject the subject conditioning. In the beginning, we don't inject the subject conditioning. Just make it general, make it indeed someone riding a horse. But now we want to later inject the subject uh, embedding uh, condition such that uh, it looks like uh, Fei-Fei riding a horse. Okay? So there is a trade-off. If alpha is too large, it looks like Fei-Fei. If his alpha is too, too, too small, it looks like a horse, but doesn't look like Fei-Fei. And only something in the middle, we can make it um, have a great trade-off. So there are some, these are the several, several examples uh, cooking together. It's mingled, but this is not mingled or yellow coin in a different style, in the wood style. So this is Hinton and Jeffrey, um, Jeff Hinton and also um, um, some Newton Einstein in the park, etc. But there's a general learning trilemma, three aspects, you cannot get both. Like GANs, you, you get the high quality samples, you get fast sampling, but the convert, uh, convert, um, convert, convergence is hard, diversity is, is not good. Uh, diffusion models have good quality and a good convergence, but, but it's pretty slow. Okay? And variational autoencoders, they have this fast, they converge well, but the quality is bad. So now let's talk about how to try to solve this trilemma, okay? especially for diffusion models, which already have good convergence and good quality and how to make it faster. Since naive uh, doing the vanilla um, version require a thousand iterations, lots of network evaluations. So let's talk about fast sampling techniques to make it faster. Let's first talk about DDIM, denoising diffusion implicit models. So rather than each step, we just denoise a little bit, denoise a little bit, and we have a larger step size. So directly uh, have from skip the middle two steps, have the fourth step, skip another two steps, directly get a clean data. But that requires more complicated functional approximations. So the original DDPM we learned so far, assume is Markovi. Right? So the next T only depends on the previous time step. Okay? That's, what, that's how we get this uh, equation. Okay? So we only use these properties during training. To get a trained model, can we design better sampling methods to use the same pre-trained model but use a less number of steps? Okay? Is it possible to define a non-Markovian forward process and corresponding reverse process that share the same diffusion kernel and loss? So that we can reuse the same model without having to retrain it. So actually, xt now not only depend on xt minus one, but also x zero. So in the reverse case, now xt minus one not only depend on xt, but also x zero. They also satisfy the original uh, terms here. So we can make it uh, a quick result here. The DDIM on top of DDPM will get changed here is that um, DDPM, the x minus one is related to xt, but now it's not only related to xt, but also x zero. And x zero is actually estimated, okay, x zero is estimated from xt. 
Okay? So in this way, we can reduce the number of steps. So now we sample this tau, okay? tau zero to s, uh, like from zero to 10 to 20, uh, 30 all the way to a thousand. So this is skipped uh, 10 steps in the middle, uh, making the total number of steps a lot less. So compared with, this is the original DDM sampling. This is the fewer step DDM sampling using the T and T slash right over here to reduce the number of steps. And we can see uh, this is the sci far using 10 steps all the way to 1,000 steps using DDIM uh, with 100 steps. It's already have a pretty good FID, the lower the better. Well, the DDPM has a pretty high FID. Like with tw uh, 20 steps, the DDPM barely just doesn't work. Pretty high FID, but DDIM is already getting a pretty good FID. Although in the end with the same number of steps, you cannot converge at the same quality, but with fewer number of steps, this is super promising. Uh, similar for CLAB A data set, with about 20 steps, you can already uh, beat the um, baseline DDPM a lot better. The reason is that DDPM, the equation hold only when the beta t is small. So each step, you cannot move too far. Uh, cannot have the too much noise, but DDIM does not rely on the assumption where beta t should be small. If you're interested, there are more advanced uh, samplers you can uh, check out at DPM solver and work. So now let's talk about another technique, progressive distillation. So we have learned distillation, we have a teacher model, we have a student model. Student model try to mimic the teacher's model. But now here we try to have a student model one step to learn the teacher model two steps. Okay, condition is that it has to be deterministic, which is very important. So we can use DDIM rather than TDPM. At each stage, the student model is trying to distill two adjacent sampling steps. Okay, so um, originally the teacher sampled two times. Okay, two steps. The student trying to use one step to learn the teacher that needs two steps. And the next stage, uh, the student from the previous stage, they begin, uh, begins to serve as a new teacher. Okay, so in the next stage, the previous student uh, require two steps, one, two, now becomes a teacher. So the teachers, a student, student, the new student begins to learn the one step that used to require two steps from the teacher. So in that way, we can gradually distill the student and student students to use fewer steps to predict which used to require a lot more steps. As we can see here, we can use fewer sampling steps by using the distilled version to match the uh, teacher's model, which used to require a lot, a lot of steps. And finally, uh, guided distillation. We remember, uh, we had the classifier free guidance, okay, the CFG, this was the equation. Remember this omega plus one and omega, right? So one is with uh, condition, one is without condition. We have to forward the network twice. Same input, xt, with condition, without condition. The two um, constants, omega one plus one, and omega, we forward it twice. Can we only forward it once? So we can distill a student model okay, um, that predict the subtraction from uh, this conditioned versus unconditioned. We use just one model, okay, the, the student model, to learn um, the, the subtracted result rather than forwarding it twice, once, second times. Now we just forward it once. We just only need to forward once. And then step two is to combine that with the progressive distillation. So we can combine the best of both worlds. Combine the guided diffusion distillation with the progressive uh, distillation, which helps with the classifier-free uh, guidance sampling. So here are some steps. So this is using only two denoising steps. Pretty impressive. It is four. Denoising steps, and this is eight 
uh, denoising steps. Okay, so finally, let's talk about some uh, acceleration techniques using uh, sparsity and also quantization. When we are editing an image, we may not add, edit everything, right? So here, we only add a sun on the top or a moon on the top. Okay? So it's only 1% or 2% of the pixels that's edited. So stable diffusion, uh, when we are trying to generate a new style, we need to work on the entire image. But after we make some edit, rather than uh, running on the entire pixels again, we only run sparsely where it gets added okay, to generate the sun or the moon uh, so that we can save the computation. Okay, originally, um, only, uh, only, since only 1.7 region is edited, but a vanilla model need to resynthesize the entire, uh, the entire image. So here, uh, we um, require only uh, one eighth of the uh, compute, okay? same number of steps by only predicting um, the pixels that has been edited and reuse the feature maps that stays unchanged. So originally, require uh, 1,800 gigaflops. Now it's only 225 gigaflops. Key idea, reduce the cache to activation and selectively only update where it gets edited. So this is how it was done. Like the original image, uh, this is where it gets edited. We added the to cloud here. And we do a subtraction, get a difference mask. Uh, difference mask is sparse. This is only uh, this is only places that gets edited, and this is the original uh, feature map. This is the edited feature map. We gather uh, the changes here. Okay, we pass it through the convolution, get it, gather the changes here, um, and then we pass it through the convolution. Only the difference, only, only the difference, only the diff, rather than originally we have to run the full image with this convolution. But now only the diff went through the convolution. And then we scatter it back to the feature map and use the original plus the scattered to get the next stage. Okay? Exploiting the feature where uh, convolution is linear. So this is some full result on image inpainting. Inpainting is saying we can uh, paint something inside the image, like a photograph of a horse on a grassland. We want to paint a horse in the image. So it's only a portion of the pixels. So, but original stable diffusion require changing everything. But now we only change where it gets edited, saving uh, about almost four times the latency. Another example, uh, this is the original uh, image. This is the edited version. And we say it's a fantasy beach landscape trending on our station rather than uh, compute on everything. We only compute on where it gets edited. Actually, I feel this is even better because here we get two coconut hat trees, but now it's correct. I'm saving about four to five X the latency running on the 3090. And actually there is a demo here. We are drawing a piece of cloud on the top right corner. And then we can see the And that's running locally on a MacBook Pro. So acceleration techniques by using quantization. What is different here? So originally when we are doing quantization, there's no concept about time step. You have only one time step, like you're doing classification, you're doing segmentation, detection, et cetera. But now uh, across different time steps, when we are plotting the range of the activation, actually they differ a lot. They actually differ a lot. So the activation distributions varies across different time steps. So the input at nearby consecutive time steps, they have relatively similar distributions. Uh, but input as distance, very like step one, step 100, at distant time steps are distributed more diversely. And so the idea is here from this paper called Q diffusion, 
um, is that you have to propose, you have to do this time step aware um, quantization approach. So at different time steps, you have a different calibration set, you have different uh, scaling factors to uh, model the different distribution. So the algorithm has three parts. Uh, so from, from T, from one to T, every uh, certain amount of uh, interval, you want to sample the intermediate inputs um, so that you can uh, have a, a calibration set at different time steps rather than like detection segmentation, we just have a single calibration set. Now across different time steps, every C time step, we collect a new, another uh, discrete, a uh, new uh, calibration set. And this is quantization the weight. This is quantization, quantizing the activations. So the key difference is when we are quantizing the activation, it also depends on the time step. With the, even the same activation at different time step, we should use different scaling factor. And there's another insight, okay? So shortcut splitting quantization. Since you do the de denoising phase, we're using a UNET. Okay, UNET first have this down sampling phase and then this up sampling phase. And there's uh, this kind of um, um, bypass connections from the down sampling and up sampling phase when the feature map is of the same resolution. Okay, when here people are, uh, people are observing that uh, the, the distribution across uh, different channels is varying drastically. Okay? Since one of them is from the down up sample layer itself, the other is actually from the down sample layer. So this bypass layer is creating a quite different uh, distribution for this activation. Okay? So rather than using the same scaling factor and bias to characterize both the x1, x2, one from the down sample layer, one from the up sample layer, we should use a separate a separate uh, scaling factors and, and biases for them. So split the activations and the weights. So one is from here, one is from here. So rather than um, doing quantization and uh, using the same manner, we want to separate these two tensors to quantize the weight and activation for them separately. So we call it tensor-wise quantization and here the weight they are using uh, channel-wise quantization. And the key reason is from this bypass branch, you know, concatenating the down sample versus together with the up sample layers. Now this Q diffusion is actually quite effective. This is the uh, full precision model running the prompt, a photograph of an astronaut riding a horse. Okay, so this is the full precision model. This is using uh, Q diffusion, W4, four bit weight, 32 bit activation, uh, weight only quantization basically. And this is Q diffusion with uh, both weight quantization and activation quantization, W4A8. Quality is still pretty impressive compared with the original naive uh, vanilla linear quantization, W4A32, even not quantizing the activation at all. Uh, the quality becomes quite poor. Okay, so we learned a lot in today's lecture, starting from uh, the basics of diffusion models. Um, we are having a lot of equations, but I want to remember is we are trying to predict the noise. Why do we need to predict the noise? Is that we can denoise and get a clean image. We talk about how to add conditions, three types of conditions, okay, class condition, and then the pixel-wise condition, and also text condition, okay. Uh, we can use the cross attention to add those text condition. And then since the resolution is too large, how do we handle that? We can use the latent diffusion, okay. So first, pass it through an encoder from BAE and work only on the latent dimension. Talk about image editing, how to uh, change the text and how to um, use uh, the, use the stroke to edit the image and also model personalization. We also talk about fast sampling techniques to accelerate the sampling process by using DDIM 
and also progressive distillation where the teacher, the student is trying to learn multiple steps from the teacher and also guided distillation for um, guidance free a scenario where we no longer have to forward twice, but use a student to forward only once. And then using sparsity to only forward where it gets edited and use quantization carefully to cater for, uh, to take into account for the different distribution across different time step. All right, that concludes not only this lecture, but also the second part of this whole uh, semester where we are talking about uh, application specific optimizations from uh, large language model to vision uh, transformers uh, to GANs, point cloud, and today uh, to uh, diffusion models. From next week, we are going to switch gear to a new chapter, which is about training. Okay? So how do we train this model across a big cluster? Okay? And how do we perform on-device training to be able to fine tune your model locally on your edge device. It'll be very exciting. And we'll have a lab tour to the server room to show you those beefy GPU servers. Hope you're enjoying uh, lab five. Feel free to ping us if we can help you with the lab five. We have an office hour after today's lecture. All right, thank you and see you next week.